Hi, I am Janetta Hamilton, and this is all about understanding the past as is reflected in my book. In Alton, we have witnessed the unveiling of the Laura Hill Historical Marker, uh, listed, um, listened to former students share their reflections about attending the school. With funding from the South Carolina Humanities Council by a grant of our Literary Literacy Foundation, you will hear a fantastic presentation on Gullum for a new generation by the legendary Ron Davis. Finally, the final portion of our grant discusses businesses. Businesses that existed in various sections of Alvin prior to the 1960s. South Carolina Humanities Council and the Janetta Hamilton Literacy Foundation as well as the Alvin community. Thank you. Hey there, and how wanna do? Those are Gullah Geechee expressions for saying hello. My name is Ron Days, I'm a cultural interpreter, a performing artist, and I'm also Vice President for Creative Education at Brooklyn Gardens. Brooklyn Gardens is a premier sculpture in gardens in this country, and it's located in Moe's Inlet, South Carolina. In the Gullah Geechee Garden exhibit, which I helped curated, we are now standing in front of a mural uh, entitled In the Garden Dance by Amiri Faris. It shows that Gullah Geechee culture is a living culture, not a stagnant one for years ago. And the one thing I think that many people are familiar with when they think about Gullah culture, perhaps might be this song. Come and let's play together in the bright sunny weather. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Lots to see and to do there. All we need now is you there. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Just take your foot in your hand. That means hurry up, don't miss the good things that we've planned. So come and let's play together in the bright sunny weather. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Gullah Gullah Island. Gullah Gullah Island. And there is a real life Gullah Geechee culture, Gullah Geechee people. Gullah Geechee heritage. We'll learn more about that in this introduction or an historical introduction to Gullah Geechee for a new generation. Just who are Gullah Geechee people? Well, Gullah Geechee people are descendants of West Africans who were brought to this country during the 1700s and 1800s to produce cash crops primarily rice. They came from these areas of Africa, the Rice Coast countries, present day Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. They also were transported from Gold Coast countries, which include Ghana, Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and Cameroon, and some also were enslaved from West Central African countries, including Congo, Gabon, and Angola. Angola sounds a lot like Gullah, and maybe that's where the word Gullah derived. Many, most Africans, however, who were brought to work on 
rice plantations came from the rice coast countries. And in Sierra Leone and Liberia, there are tribal groups known as the Golas, sounds like Gala, and the Gizi, spelled K-I-S-S-I, but pronounced Gizi, and it sounds a lot like Gichi. The origin is unknown. They were brought to communities in this country that as of 2006 became known as the Federal Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, spanning along the Atlantic coast all the way from Wilmington, North Carolina, down through South Carolina, including the community of Alvin, uh, Georgia, all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida. And I think it's something very interesting uh, that the four, plan four former plantations on which Brook Green Gardens is established includes Brook Green Plantation, the Oaks, Springfield, and Laurel Hill. And we are talking about the commemoration of the marker for the Laurel Hill School in Alvin, South Carolina. Language is important to Gullah Geechee culture and history. And this introductory panel for the Gullah Geechee Garden reads, And a dish a garden for see the ting them will grow. These plant them have special meaning for explain what Gullah Geechee da, for people will want to know. The crops they was will tell about this grand culture the language and the Gullah Geechee people them in Judge Town, South Carolina. Now, this uh, English as well as in Gullah Geechee, all that's available on the free Brook Green Gardens app. You go to um, the tours once there, and you can hear this as well as all of the other panels in the Gullah Geechee Garden. But we're going to be talking about Gullah Geechee culture, not just in Georgetown, but also in the community of Alvin, South Carolina. Spirituality is an important value or value in Gullah Geechee culture and heritage and awareness that despite any difficulties that we may be enduring, there is a God who we can turn to, gives us comfort and peace. Here is a, an Adinkra symbol um, from uh, Ghana, West Africa, and it means accept God, the importance of God. Uh, at the dedication service for the historical marker of uh, the school, uh, there were many spiritual leaders, and I'm sure in their minds there was this particular song that would be of importance. I'm sure it also must have been sung at times in the Alvin community. Hell will bring you out all right. Prayer will bring you out all right. You just take your feet out of the mire clay. Prayer will bring you out all right. Brought my mother out all right. Brought my mother out all right. You just take your feet out of the mire clay. Prayer will bring you out all right. And that syncopation known as a low country or a Gullah Geechee beat that harkens from West Africa. Respect for elders is an important carryover from our West African heritage and has been handed down within Gullah Geechee culture to this day. Respect for elders brings about wisdom and it's all about connecting us with our kin. One thing that you should always respect your elder because if you don't, he or she has the ability to put the mount on you. That's a curse of unfavorable circumstances which 
old folks are said to be able to administer by looking at you real angry like, sometimes out of only one eye, and then by pointing a finger threateningly in your direction. You never ever wanted to see an elderly person do that to you because it meant that somehow you had disrespected him or her. And it's important to remember that it's the old sheep that doesn't know the road. And the young man must find out all those things that the old sheep doesn't know. Come and let's play together in the bright sunny weather. Let's all go to Gala Gala Island. Gala Gala! Hi, my name is Cheryl, and this is my daughter Morgan, and we do our walking Gala Gala Island. And our question is, is there a chance that there will be a reboot of the show? And if not, what are you doing to extend the history of Gala to the next generation? Thank you. Cheryl and Morgan, thank you for that question. I don't know if there will be a reboot to the show Bella Bella Island. Um, when it was in production, it was in production for four years, 1994 through 1999. And at that time, that was the longest period of production for any Nick Jr. shows. But the kids were getting older. Um, it was a preschooler um, show and the boys were getting voices like this. And the girls were beginning bodies, and the cameramen would be looking at them very closely. But um, it was a very fun experience. Um, since then, I've been doing a number of things to bring awareness to Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. My job here at Brooklyn Gardens, I've written several books about Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. My wife and I do performances, my wife Natalie, real life wife, and she is doing um, art, visual art, that uh, very much uh, helps to celebrate Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. Thanks for that question. Taylor, my favorite food is chicken and rice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love rice. And that's an important part of Gullah Geechee heritage. It said that Gullah Geechee people can eat rice not once, twice, but three times a day. Those who uh, come into Gullah Geechee communities find that quite strange. Eating all these rice dishes, red rice, rice and shrimp, rice and okra, rice, rice, rice. Um, but. And we also eat Hop and John. I don't know if you're a Hop and John either. Hop and John is peel peas cooked with what? Cooked with rice. Now, people from other communities say it's black eyed peas cooked with rice. But Gullah Geechee people say, uh uh uh, you gotta use Hop and John, those brown peel peas, crowded, crowded peas. And Hop and John is generally eaten um, on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve for good luck. Remember, most of the ancestors of Gullah Geechee people came from the rice-producing countries of Africa, where rice was a staple of their diets. So for them to have a rice dish on the beginning of the new year meant that they would be pretty fortunate throughout the remainder of the year. Uh, a part of Gullah Geechee grammar is that when words are spoken that begin with a V, the V is substituted with a W. Sometimes so it wouldn't be said that you're on a vacation, it would be said that you're on a vacation. And on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, when Gullah Geechee people eat Pop and John, we yam them with a certain vegetable or vegetable. Do you know what vegetable we eat the Hop and John with? Collard greens for greenbacks or prosperity throughout the new year. 
Creativity is another important value or value of Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. And I think about the creativity that was involved in celebrating. The celebration of the Alvin Community Center years ago that was built on the site of uh, the historic school. And my wife Natalie and I were invited to the dedication service of the Alvin Community Center. There were different things, foods, banyan, and that's the Gullah Geechee expressions for eat. There were all kinds of, kinds of music for Ranky Tanky. That's we get physical kind of expressive movement. And there were stories to yeti or to hear. Now, this is one of the stories that I shared at that event for the um, Alvin Community Center built on the site of the Laurel Hill School. It was the Exodus. I mean, the Hebrew children are mad, sorry, easy to learn from under that man. Hey, bro, go up in the travel on for them, but lead their way. Him better claw for them in the daytime, then him then fire for them come night. Him better lead the way, him people all the time. That's why I saw him raise up Moses in the first place, so that Moses one day can go on to meet old Pharaoh and tell him, say, the Lord won't only for let all people go free. Now listen to this. Moses they have a gone tell Pharaoh God message over and over again, because Pharaoh didn't pay him no mind. No, no, him would get mad up so much and make plenty more work was break the back of that Hebrew slave chilling. Now, God would have to make Pharaoh know that God they go. And a Pharaoh ain't been no God. And it that's it. And it that's so. Moses going to Pharaoh and tell him, say, God won't honor for let God people go free. Him was break the back of them Hebrew slave children, but here we yeah, listen to anything that our um, Moses may have a talent for say. And bring down fiction poem, have a more fiction in the life of Pharaoh people. Frogs and a crook with every oh, oh in the kitchen, in the yard, oh, even in the bed. When Pharaoh yet keep pe God people from all the worst of it, oh God, God tell him this is what all I have to do. Protect, kill, a Passover lamb. Protect the blood of that lamb and put it upon the top of that house. Because that night, God dead angel ain't gonna come by there. And ain't gonna stop it. And yet see the blood of that Passover lamb. That night. In the middle of the night time, God, dead angel come for true. Day clean come and find the first one child in every house of several people. Dead. Dead, dead, I say. <laughs> oh, what a weeping and a wailing that miss that day. Pharaoh going to Moses and tell him, say, get, get, all that all the people, get away from you. So you know what Moses and them do? They up and go. Their travel and their travel till they come down to the Red Sea. Oh, then you know what to do. The Red Sea before them, and they were adding them to put it fast out of them. Now Moses ain't been troubling mine. No, no. Him didn't know that God been a leader, just like God been a promise. So him pick up that road that God be again. And pick up that road, scratch him over the Red Sea, and tell them people say, God Almighty. Dear Father, we sign. A sign from the Lord come down at the time, you know? That red sea been open up like nobody yet never seen happen before. The water been rolled back, made a pathway clean to the other side. Great God! Now, when Moses and Hebrew children jump in the crossover from the other side, Pharaoh and Adam army stab a over Adam. Go and make that water rush back down on the top of the head. And only know what happened to them. Oh, they get killed up. <laughs> oh, none of the Lord can explain. But like I've been sick, 
God is a little bit of arrogant people. And just like him, they are promised. And then keep on a little in time to promise land. That's why I saw the Gullah Gigi people say to this day, let me just hold on to the hand of the Lord. Self-sufficiency is also a very important part of our heritage and of our culture. Using what we have to take care of all our needs. And I think this was evidenced uh, by some of the comments given by former students of the Royal Hill School. One or several of them said that they each needed to bring an egg with them to school each day. And that's what the cafeteria workers would use to make their lunch. They had to use what they had to make sure they got there. Hi, my name is Damaka, and I'm interested in learning about the Gala people. My, my question is, where did the Gala people come from? Damaka, it's so important to know where Gala Gigi people came from. Our ancestors are primarily West Africans from the Rice Coast countries, as well as the Gold Coast countries and West Central African countries. Um, in 2004, uh, I visited Ghana, West Africa, as part of a Fulbright Hayes scholarship. I was there for five weeks. One of the things that was striking to me about that experience was that when the plane landed, I began to see all these people who looked like my father's people. Um, um, I could pick them out as my aunt, these are my cousins. Um, uh, and people would see me staring at them. And um, also, during that uh, five-week stay, whenever I and the 12 other educators were out in the community, and I was the only African-American male, uh, all the Ghanaians would wait until the others had moved aside and then they would come over speaking to me. They spoke in the Fante language. I do not speak Fante. But I understood that because of my physical features, uh, they thought that I was either Ghanaian or African. They did not think that I was African American. And our physical features is, uh, are one of the connections with our West African heritage. When uh, the next year, when I went to uh, Sierra Leone, uh, and just last year, uh, I made a second trip to Sierra Leone, but in that country, I saw numerous people who look like my mother's people. And um, the first time there, the Minister of Tourism and Culture said he saw me coming off that plane. Uh, it was for an historical event. He said, oh, you look like my people. I am Fula. He said, you are Fula. F-U-L-A, Fula. Uh, and so I thought maybe I was Fula. But when I did DNA testing by AfricanAncestry.com, I found out that my maternal lineage is from the Temne people of Sierra Leone. And my paternal uh, lineage is from the Ewe and Akan people of Ghana, West Africa. So that's an important thing that you may try to do through AfricanAncestry.com, um, finding out your specific um, connection with West African heritage. When I served on and as chairman of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, one of the things that numerous community members stated that was uh, the terms Gullah and Geechee, were they different? Well, uh, at one time, Gullah was a term used by historians, uh, anthropologists, uh, as an identifier of those people who are descendants of West Africans who were brought to this country to produce cash crops who lived in South Carolina and North Carolina. Geechees were the same demographic but who lived in 
uh, Georgia and Florida. Those persons lived near the Ogeechee River, which is of Native American heritage. And because those living along the Ogeechee River were from those rice countries, it would say Geechee people eat a lot of rice. Those were terms that were brought a lot of shame and embarrassment to people because it was said that if you spoke this way or if you had this particular strange, unusual heritage, there was something substandard about you. But get that out of your minds. And there are many younger people today who realize this and who celebrate their Gullah Geechee heritage. Um, one of the things that was determined uh, with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission was that as opposed to identifying these people over here as one thing and these people over here as another thing, our language, our culture, uh, we are the same people. Not Gullah, not Geechee, but Gullah Geechee. Karen, your question, do I have an experience of code switching? Uh, why, yes, I do. Um, and code switching is a way uh, many who Gullah Geechee people just do normally. We speak English um, um, as comfortably and as well as possible in social situations. But when we get around those who we are certain are not uh, going to bring shame to us because of our way of speech, we will comfortably speak our uh, Geechee words and expressions. And I do that quite readily. Um, when I am among friends, I find that even when I'm writing uh, on Facebook, <laughs> if it's someone who, is in, who I know understands where I'm from, I will use Gullah Geechee words and expressions there also. Tenacity, heritage, and family and community are the last three or three things that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, during the unveiling of the historic marker, one of the former students talked about the students having to walk for miles to get to the school. And while they were walking, uh, their, the white students going to another school were on buses, and that they, the students on the buses, would spit at them as they walked, and they'd throw rocks out of their windows. But one individual I remember saying that one day, uh, when all this was going on, that he and others went down in a ditch just, you know, for protection, to protect themselves. But there was a thought of tenacity that they had because that individual filled a bag full of sand, I think it was. And when the bus rolled by again, what he said was that they tossed that bag of sand into the open window on the school bus and he said that it bust up. <laughs> the sand bust up over all of the children on the bus. And I, all that sand just bust up in the current face. So the, the bus driver found out it was Evelyn and came to my granddaddy. And I was right there standing up. So Willis, your daughter, your, your granddaughter chunk a, a bag of sand in there and and just, just bust all up in the, in the current field. My granddaddy said, yes, I'm Mr. Vindham. Said, but they been to come home every day, man, see how your people on the bus been a chill thing out and hit them. To stop them from hitting them and they want you no more sign in it. I remember that just like that. And because he stood up, there's nothing more said about that. Tenacity is important. Heritage. Uh, as there are all kinds of beliefs of Gullah Geechee heritage. I don't know in the Alvin community. Are you familiar with the story of the hag? You're waking at night feeling so there's a pressure on your chest, on your face. And um, then you try to scream out and realize that no one hears you, that even yourself, it's said that you are being ridden by a hag. 
a hag is supposedly um, an older community member, man or woman, but most times it's a woman who has the, abil the ability to shed his or her skin, become invisible, and then they would straddle the individual at night on their chest and they would pull air out of their nostrils or blood out of their veins. And that's why those who are hag ridden uh, the next morning, this is things that I couldn't sleep all night. I'm just so tired. That's because a hag is riding. And there are certain beliefs of how to make sure that one is not hag ridden. One of those ways is to throw salt at it. Another belief is that you should keep an open Bible or maybe a newspaper in your room because a hag has to read all of the words in whatever document there, there is from the end back to the beginning before morning. Because if day clean or morning comes and the hag hasn't finished, then the hag would not be able to get back into his or her skin. But the most familiar way is to put a broom by your doorway or by your window and opening into your house because a hag supposedly will not be able to pass by that broom. Now you may want to try this. Put a broom by a door in your home. And if someone who always visited you is not sensitive, don't worry about it, because they were probably a hag. Now, another belief is what do people in Alvin do to bring down their pressure or their high blood pressure? A belief is that you should take Spanish moss, that gray stuff that hangs from the trees, pull some off and stuff it inside of your shoe. Wearing moss in your shoe is a surefire way to bring down your high blood pressure. Now, years ago, I shared this story and someone from the medical profession said afterwards that he thought that there was a lot of validity in that practice because the chemical properties in Spanish moss are replicated for the production of hypertension medication. And that years ago when people wore moss inside of their shoes at a time when they didn't wear socks and didn't wear stockings, the friction from walking released those chemicals that entered the body through the small blood vessels at the bottom of the feet, entered their circulatory system and actually would work. But I would advise this, if you want to try that as an experiment, use only the moss that is hanging on the trees, not moss that has been lying on the ground, because moss that lies on the ground carries red bugs and skin chiggers, and you could get severe skin irritations. Family and community is the last very important aspect of Gullah culture and heritage. So I invite you to share in your heritage of family and community of Alvin. Listen to the old stories, the tales, and learn about the importance of who you are. Hey, Mr. Ron, what have you found that people are confused about pertaining to Gullah or Geechee culture? Carolyn, very good question. What have I found that people are confused about um, uh, pertaining to Gullah Geechee culture? Lots of people are confused uh, that it is a living culture. They think that it is a culture from some 200, 300 years ago, sometimes in the art. Um, they feel that Gullah Geechee people are those who dressed in clothing from the period of slavery or reconstruction. Gullah Geechee people today dress the same way as other people, um, contemporary people do. 
Belgici people all speak the same way. But there are numerous people, um, like when I went to college, uh, Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, um, I, I did not think of myself as speaking in any strange way. Uh, but people would hear something in my voice, a musicality to it. Uh, on the first day in the cafeteria, I heard speech at the table behind me, and I looked around quickly to say, find out who from St. Helena Island had traveled here that I wasn't aware of. But these were people from uh, the Virgin Islands, Jamaica, and uh, all island people and parts of the African diaspora. Uh, communities throughout the world where Africans were scattered throughout the slave trade. And each of us have a connection in our speech ways, in our beliefs, our spirituality, our music as well. So there is this connection that some people are unfamiliar with, but they should find out more about. Pasha, no, I do not. I wish I did, but I do know it's a part of my heritage. Um, sweet grass baskets are made from natural natural materials. Uh, there's sweet grass, a marsh grass, uh, pine needles, and also um, pine needles. Sometimes use bulrush, sweetgrass, pine needles, and I can't think just what the other one is. But it's all woven together uh, using the coil method of sewing um, these materials together. And uh, during the days of plantations, you know, these baskets were used for practical purposes, sometimes storing grain or for ser food servers. But today they have artistic value. And um, this past year, when I visited Sierra Leone again, I went to a Temne village called Rog Rogbanko. And Rogbanko is the village in Sierra Leone where sweetgrass baskets first were made. They are called shukublai baskets. Um, that's what the marsh, the, the, the marsh grass is called there. But they are made exactly the same. And in that Temne village, because I found out by, through DNA testing that I'm of Temne heritage, um, the village elder welcomed me and my family as Temne descendants um, to their village because of that connection of sweet grass baskets. I would tell young people to learn about your heritage. Know about your heritage. Um, your culture is the way that people live from day to day, the foods they eat the clothes they wear, the stories they listen to, the music that they listen to, um, all aspects of your day-to-day -day life. Your heritage are those aspects of day-to-day -day life of your parents and your grandparents and great-grandparents. And knowing this is so very important because those stories that you hear at the unions, uh, picnics, they help you to know, for instance, if there are certain illnesses within your family. Um, and with that awareness, you can make sure that you can take whatever precautions are necessary throughout an early part of your life before waiting when it might just befall you out of ignorance. Also, those stories help you to know who are Binyas and Kamyas. Now, I'm a Binya. And on the Nick Jr. TV show, we had a large family pet called Binya Binya Pollywog, a name that I pitched to the producers. 
Uh, anyone who's a native of the Gullah Geechee community, as of Alvin, South Carolina, who have been here, or Benya, we are Benyas. If someone comes into a Gullah Geechee community from any place else in the universe, from Shiraz, or from Afghanistan, or, you know, New Hampshire, they would never be called a Benya. They would be called a Kamya. And it's important to know all of the vineyards in your community. You might be um, Unfortunately, if you don't, you could get married to someone who is actually related to you. So you need to know all these important things about your heritage. Take pride in it. In my book, Grandma Vic, I use her word as saying, Lord, I done been through something, yeah? But there were always businesses, Black-owned businesses in Alvin prior to the 1960s and after. As recounted by Christine, Mrs. Christine Vives, we will share some of those businesses with you. Our families throughout the community had unique or various means to supplement their income. But some of the Black-owned businesses that existed in various sections of Alvin are listed here. The Greentown, Duffet Hill, down the road, Sherylite Lane, in the corner, over the bridge, and even wrapped up. Greentown, for example, carpenters. Most of the people, residents of Alvin were addressed as con. I don't know why, but some of the carpenters were con but and con grant. There were stores, a store that was owned by Condora. We also had veterans, um, World War II veterans, Mr. Addison Green, Edward Hamilton, Walter Pyle. I'm not sure if Pandora was the midwife, but we can check that out. Then we have the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Now, later, a little further down, we have Dufford Hill. We have the score that was owned by Mr. Paul Hamilton, the receiver. Um, he also owned a farm and even transportation service. On Highway 45, we had transportation by Con Masik. And there was a hairdresser, Olivia, and Henrietta. Convey uh, was a midwife. And there was an old school that my grandma Vic used to attend on Highway 45. Further on down Highway 45, we had um, a shop joint uh, owned by Clarence and Melinda Miranda. And we also had a post office in Alabama. On Highway 45, there was a snack shop owned by Mike Prello. Uh, and Maddie was a midwife. Uh, there was also the Mr. Hines shop and store. And we had World War II veteran, Mr. Silas Hamilton. Oh, in the center of Alvin, there was a huge store. The store was on, owned by Con Bob, Con, Con uh, Bob Lutry. He was a huge property owner. He also had Ritz Mill, and he was World War II, I'm sorry, World War I back. If this was also the entertainment club, um, first, upon to Mrs. Vice, um, his, his owners started out with a little tent. Then they went to a building. Finally, the building was transformed into three roofs. It was called the Three Roof Inn by Vera and Oliver Moodry. Food, drinks, dancing for all, young and old, and the best fish sandwiches in the world. Uh, Mr. Moodry Oliver was also a World War II veteran. Then we have the Laura Hill School. Let's go, let's take a ride um, in Shell Night Lane and slash in the corner. We had shops. Um, by Mr. David, kind of David Brown, and he also later had a, a syrup mill. And Mike Buford sharpened um, hoes and axes and things like that for the farm. Mr. Leroy Brown was our leader 
educator. We have a midwife, comes up, a hairstylist, Eunice. World War II vet, Mr. Danny Lampkin, and another midwife, Colonel Ella Lampkin. Well, we're not through yet. Around the corner, we had a midwife, and should they? Patty Nelson is her name. Then we had Mr. Elijah Kremler, who had a huge farm, a tobacco barn, the sweet potatoes. All of these were African American people who owned their own business prior to the 60s. Uh, Mr. Crell was also a World War II vet. Down the road, we had uh, Mr. Jim Wright, who had a blacksmith shop. World War II veteran, Mr. Thomas Bryant, and World War I veteran, Mr. Henry Hamilton. There was a shop owned by Kanasi, the barber shop owned by Matthew Vice. He also had a, a dry goods store. He even showed movies back in those days. And Mrs. Vice on sweets and drinks. Uh, Mr. Jesse Vice was a Korean veteran. There was a little train track that um, was, is now that was in the area who that brought logs from way back in the pen field. Not through yet, we had a um, woman. This woman the Green had a joint jukebox and a bar. Um, Julian Green, Hopwood dealer. Uh, this, this is Eunice Hartwell and Beauty Shop, a joint and a jukebox with a jukebox. We also have Mrs. Um, and Ada Nelson, who was also a midwife. Ada, in fact, she delivered me. Um, Ada and Hannah, they had a can of sugar cane milk and a grits milk over the bridge. But just before we got over the bridge, there was a place, a pond, it's called Repto. There they had baptism, swimming, fishing. And over the bridge, there was a post office. There were many, many businesses in Alvin to help the people survive and live a prosperous life. So, my challenge to you is to research some of the additions, research additional businesses that existed in the Alvin community. And some of the businesses are also this is another one. Uh, when you get to the chapter on personal stories. So let us understand the past, prepare for the future, so we can move forward. Let us understand our history. Thank you.